So welcome to everyone. Um, so please keep yourself muted unless you're speaking. The chat feature is a great way to ask questions to the group, um, or you can send a private message. We will be taking Q&A after each presentation. So if you do chat and uh, the presentation is still going on, know that we'll look at the chat function when we get to the Q&A portion. We are recording this presentation. If you are having technical difficulties, it sometimes helps to log off and then sign back in. And that usually takes care of any problems. Uh, thank you to Enlo Medical Center for CMA, CME. There will be a follow-up email and we will highlight the um, Enlo Structural Heart Program at the end of Dr. Ariel's presentation. So please stay on the line even after we do his, the Q&A with him um, because you do wanna hear about the Structural Heart Program at Enlo. I'm Christy Bird McKeeve. I'm the Executive Director of Butte Glen Medical Society and the CEO of a new 501c3 called Healthy Rural California. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Madden Ariel, who has been with Enlo for just under a year um, after finishing his fellowship at the University of Oslo. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours, Dr. Ariel. Can you see the slides? Yes, it's the two of them. Say that again? You have the two up. Did you want to just do the one? Okay. How about now? That's perfect. Okay. Let's go full screen. All right. So, you know, when they asked me to do this uh, thrombosis and thrombophilia, I thought like it's a huge topic. So where do I start from? Uh, you know, cause there are so many questions that needs to be answered. So I thought uh, maybe I'll answer a few questions today uh, that are related to GUX that are most commonly asked uh, every day. I get these questions all the time. You know, I'm sure you will have these questions also. Uh, so let's start. So what are the, the this is the online um, outline for the today's presentation. So when and which do I actually use? What to do if uh, they have recurrent VTE or venous foam embolism while they are on do -X? And uh, how long do we use this? Uh, when to not use it? Uh, when to possibly use and not use it? And what to do with the do -X pre procedure? I guess this is the single um, questions, single most common questions that we get every day. So let's start. Uh, so, you know, these drugs used to be called novel oral anticoagulants. So slowly you realize that they are no more novel. And their, their name was changed to target specific oral agents. And they again changed it to uh, non vitamin K oral anti anticoagulants, uh, which, uh, which confused uh, a lot of people. Uh, actually, some people said uh, no AC means no anticoagulation. So that was a confusing term as well. So now we have finally set out with what is called as direct oral anticoagulants, and that's what we should be using uh, the term every day in our practice, and that, that's how people understand these drugs these days. So uh, talking about uh, what are the DOACs uh, that are um, uh, available. So anticoagulants that are presently available, um, I won't be talking about um, low molecular weight heparin, heparin, warfarin, all those things, but I would be mainly focusing my discussion on factor 10 inhibitors and direct uh, thrombin inhibitors, also known as uh, DTI. Um, and uh, this is uh, Dabigatran. And for factor 10 inhibitor, uh, we have uh, four of them, Rivaroxaban, Epixaban, Doxaban, and Betrixaban. Betrixaban so far has only one indication in ICU patients, uh, uh, and also can be given in renal failure patients, but we won't be talking about that today. Um, for some reason, Doxaban, uh, and dabigatran has fallen out of favor. The reason being, when you basically use these drugs for the venous thromboembolism for the first five days, you have to use Lovenox with it, uh, meaning you have to have some lead in anticoagulation before you can, after five days before you can start these drugs. So that's why many people don't, don't like these drugs. Uh, so I'm gonna be focusing mainly on two drugs today that are most commonly used, which are Rivaroxaban, also known as Geraldo, and Epixaban, also known as Elibris. 
and our discussion will be mainly focused on those two drugs. So these are a lot of advantages uh, if you actually uh, look at this table compared to uh, warfarin. Um, so um, uh, the, the good thing is they don't require greasing, you know, uh, you can directly use them from day one. Um, you have increased time in therapeutic range, also known as TTR. They have increased quality of life. Um, and the most important with Apixaban is they are very minimally renally excreted, 25% of the patients. Um, and, uh, and although we do not have, uh, we do not have a, um, a good antidote that still exists for this uh, Rivroxaban and Apixaban, but we have a good antidote that works for Dabigatran or Pidaxa. Um, so uh, we'll be talking about, if we have time, we'll be talking about antidotes as well. So when and which one to use? So this should be, these drugs, um, Apixaban and Rivroxaban, uh, Doax, should be your first line of treatment unless there are a few exceptions, which I'm going to talk, be talking about. Uh, this is from Anticoagulation Forum, um, ACCP guidelines, as well as ASK guidelines, American Society of Hematology. Both of these recommend that we use these drugs for DVT or PE as a first line, unless there are a few exceptions, as I said, which we're going to be talking about. So what is the take home message? Why these drugs are number one? Uh, the reason being, uh, you know, when they compared with warfarin, there was greater reduction in mortality with these drugs. And number two, if you actually look about the intracranial hemorrhage associated with these drugs compared to Coumadin, uh, that was actually superior. So one is to 300 compared to one is to six. Uh, so the one is to 600 with Doax compared to one is to 300 with Coumadin. So that's pretty good with a relative risk of around 0 0.45. I would, I would use these drugs because there's almost you can see half, uh, so uh, introduction of intracranial hemorrhage. So these, these drugs are pretty good. Uh, besides this, Apixaban and Rivaroxaban has also been associated with decreased GI bleed rates. That's why we tend to use these drugs. So now let's talk about which Doax to use. So because we have Apixaban and Rivaroxaban mainly on the market that, have, uh, that are uh, pretty good and most people use liking, uh, uh, most people use these drugs, okay? So I'm going to be saying this. So the first thing is they do not have head-to-head -head clinical trials to compare Epixaban and Rivaroxaban. But what we do have is um, we, uh, the randomized control trial is awaited. But what we do have and what we know so far is uh, from the real-world data, which is better than retrospective data, we know that Epixaban uh, has slightly superior advantages compared to Rivaroxaban. And this is one of the meta-analyses that we did on almost uh, 45,000 patients, and that was published uh, two years ago. Uh, and this is thought to be due to two regions, because when you have uh, rivaroxaban, which is mainly given as a once-a-day drug, um, you tend to have a, a pick to trough ratios that are high as a result. Uh, there might be big break, more breakthrough um, uh, recurrent uh, venous thromboembolism, and there might be more recurrent bleedings, you know. So that's why, uh, although the recurrent VTE was not that statistically significant, but the bleeding in our meta-analysis was statistically significant in the Epixaban group. So my preference, especially in patients who have um, uh, kidney function that are low, um, you know, on a patient who has probably high risk of bleeding like uh, menstrual bleed. Uh, you know, those type of patients, I tend to favor Epixaban because of these reasons, you know? So, and from this, number needed to handle 345, and uh, thus showing that uh, Epixaban is favorable compared to Rivaroxaban in terms of reduction in bleeding, and maybe towards uh, decreasing, uh, decreasing um, recurrent uh, venous thrombomolism. So where does that put, uh, and as I said, this is the, uh, the peak to trough ratio for uh, Rivaroxaban is 10 and Epixaban is 3. That means you get more steady level of the drug throughout the day when you use twice a day drug. As a result, your breakthrough bleeding as well as breakthrough clots are uh, lower with Epixaban. And that's the whole hypothesis generating this, uh, this discussion, you know? So now let's, let's tackle this problem and uh, we can, we can uh, we can do a few more. So I have a 24-year-old female on combined oral contraceptive pills for two years. Periods were well controlled on 
oral contraceptives, no evidence of massive or submassive P. Uh, would you discharge this patient from the uh, to home, from the emergency room? So the, the first question is that one. And, and there's more and more evidence that we can do these days, you know? So can discharge if low risk or stable uh, for patients for, and unless there are some massive or massive P's, I tend to, we tend to discharge them from the ER. There's no uh, reason to have it. But the more important question is, if this patient has a history of uh, bleeding, which do I actually use? Um, uh, if she had a, um, uh, she probably is gonna likely to have more menstrual bleed, which one do you want to use? Navigatran, since reversion is available, which is known as praxibine or idarazizumab, or would you like to use rivaroxaban given once a day dosing, or would you like to use apixaban? So again, as I said, people who have slightly higher risk of bleeding, uh, mainly a, uh, mainly a menstrual bleed, I tend to favor apixaban in those patients. So I would go with apixaban in this patient. And that is further, uh, further highlighted by this study where they actually compared rivaroxaban with actually a coumadin, um, uh, vitamin K antagonist. And actually the risk when they compared with vitamin K antagonist, actually rivaroxaban had more bleeding. So maybe the menstrual bleed. So uh, in, in people who have high, um, heavy menstrual bleed, uh, we tend to avoid the rivaroxaban. That's one take home message from this presentation. You know, and um, apixaban, as you can see, that the, the, the bleeding risk was uh, uh, statistically not significant. As a result, apixaban is favored in these patients. So, and doxaban and every davigatran, as we discussed, we, we don't use them that much and they have fallen out of favor. So, and um, uh, we don't use them. So, uh, so, that was one factor, right? One was a bleeding factor. So especially if you're considering for bleeding, especially in patients who have increased risk of bleeding, you tend to favor apixaban. Now let's go into a next scenario where you think maybe patient compliance is an issue because not all your patients who you give GOATs take them uh, faithfully. And especially if you give twice a day drop, that might not be, uh, that as you can imagine, those drops can have, uh, can have decrease compliance compared to once a day drop. So, so as you can see in the, in the same, uh, present, uh, same study that we published, so uh, actually uh, is, uh, the real world data, although the recurrent risk of DTE were less with apixaban, but, um, but what about the adherence to go at? So uh, if you have a questionable compliance, I would use rivaroxaban because in the study they have noted that the compliance with Rivaroxaban is 90% compared to apixaban being only 80%. So that that should basically um, should uh, should tell you that if you are concerned about the adherence issue, that this might be a better drug to use. So this slide basically, especially in AFI patient, basically um, highlights uh, which which of these um, drugs to use. If there's high risk of bleeding, again, apixaban is a drug of choice. If there's a previous GI bleeding, again, apixaban is a uh, choice, choice of agent, especially if they have a CKD. Um, and, um, uh, you know, if they have a, um, uh, um, other renal impairment or a GI upset, again, apixaban is the drug to use. Uh, there's one scenario where rivaroxaban has more data for AZ patients, although we're not talking about AZ, but those are patients who have coronary artery disease. It is because that they have a study to prove that rivaroxaban is better in this scenario compared to other drugs. So that's the only scenario where rivaroxaban may be better. But other than that, if you are worried about bleeding, if you're worried about CKD, if you're worried about GI bleed, if you're worried about intracranial hemorrhage, if you're worried about menorrhagia, all those patients should be with favor epixaban compared to rivaroxaban. Now let's talk about the, so that was, that was the first question. Now let's tackle the next question. What to do if, if they have uh, VTE or venous thromboembolism while on DOEX. So we see this all the time, right? All the time, meaning I see this uh, being referred uh, many times. So because somebody was on rivaroxaban or epixaban, they had another problem. So the number one question you should be asking these patients is adherence, because as we uh, discussed that uh, non-compliance with these drugs are 10% for rivaroxaban and 20% for epixaban. Um, you should do an age-appropriate screening test for the cancer. Uh, you should do a, something called, you should always look out for antiphospholipid syndrome because now there have been three studies published for antiphospholipid syndrome in which these patients do worse with uh, GOAX compared to Coumadin and Coumadin are the first line of drug in these patients. So 
having said that, what are the other factors we, to, we should look, look into? So if, if there might be drug interactions, which especially the age olds and the fungals, you know, clarithromycin antibiotics and all those type of drugs. Um, and the, the single most important question I find um, that we should be asking these patients is if the patient is on rivaroxaban, uh, they, they can have a breakthrough bleed, a breakthrough um, BTE uh, if, they, if rivaroxaban is not taken with food. So it should always be taken with food. Uh, so you should inquire about this. If they have a bypass surgery, you know, um, the absorption is somewhat erratic and they can have another blood clot while they are on Boats. So I would definitely ask that question. Um, vasculitis, uh, pregnancy is contraindicated. We don't use this drug, drugs and heparin induced thrombocytopenia if you use it, maybe they can have a breakthrough clot. So now, now let's see this question, you know. So and uh, uh, let's talk about this case. So 62 year old female on apixaban for a month for P, Sorrow shortness of breath and chest pain. Now we we'll see has a chest pain and has a new diagnosis of cancer and with new key. Uh, so is this a case of GOAD failure? She has been on uh, GOAD for four months, uh, would you call it? Probably, sorry, four weeks. Uh, probably yes, because um, she has been four weeks. One to two weeks, you may not say that this is GOAD failure, but you know, after four weeks, uh, this is probably a GOAD failure because of the, uh, of the cancer. So what is the, uh, what do we do in this scenario is if they have GOAC failure, especially if they develop it early when they had a blood clot within one to two months or one to three months. What I tend to do in these patients, and these are guided by some of the evidence that I tend to, because, uh, better, because you want to pull them off because they are still at very high risk of having blood clots. And what is pulling off is by doing a low molecular with heparin or low inox for almost two months. Um, I do them for uh, one to two months. Uh, I, I, for someone, I do um, two, to, uh, two to three months as well. So, and after that, I tend to switch them to the former GOAX that they were on, you know, or you can go to the other one as well if you're concerned about it. But um, if you want to pull them off for the first two months, you should put them on Lominox or Lomotru with heparin. So that was the second question. So what you do when uh, you have a uh, GOAX failure? And what are the things you should be looking for? Now let's try to tackle the next question that we uh, that we tend to get all the time. And how long do we use these drugs for? Okay. So, and this is a very important question uh, because patients ask you all the time, how long do I have to be on this? Am I done with this? You know. So in general, first episode of unprovoked, and we're talking about only unprovoked because they have a high risk of recurrence. You know. Um, so. In the first year, it's 10%, and as the time goes by, 10 years is 36%. And approximately, if you calculate uh, around this 10 years time frame, uh, they are also at risk of uh, death, which is around 4%. You know, so having that number, now what do we do? So, if you have clearly provoking factors, if it's DVT, I tend to use them for three months. If it's PE, I tend to use them for six months. Um, and after six months, uh, you know, if you think you still need to use these drugs, you can reduce the dose to half the, what the patient was taking. Meaning, if, you, if the patient was taking Eliquis or Apixaban, 5 mg twice a day, you can change that to 2.5 mg twice a day. And if the patient was taking um, Rivaroxaban, 20 mg daily, you can change that to 10 mg daily. Uh, the reason being, there was no difference between the full dose and uh, full dose and a half dose, uh, but there was slightly increased risk of bleeding, a major bleeding rate with a full dose. So you can you can do this. Okay, so you can confidently do that. You, you can change this uh, to half dose after six months. Now, so the question is to ask: um, How long do you use GOAX? First, number question number is one is: Was it provoked by hormones or immobility trauma? Then you use it for three to six months. So if now let's see, this was unprovoked. So. The next question is, do they need a hypercoagulated workup? They probably need a hypercoagulated workup. And most importantly, out of these all, I would probably say antiphospholipid syndrome is the most important hypercoagulated workup that you have to do, because if it's unprovoked and you, you are planning to uh, anticoagulate these patients anyway, others may not add that much benefit, but antiphospholipid syndrome, you have to do it because uh, you might have to switch them to um, coumadin if they have antiphospholipid syndrome. 
So that's the number two, number two question. But like, let's say if you have unprovoked, and, but you don't have underlying thrombophilia, like you don't have all those that are written there, any possibility of syndrome, homozygous or heterozygous, homozygous for factor five, you, don't, you have to have homozygous. Homozygosity or prothrombin gene mutation, all these things you don't have. So what do you do? You know, so my approach for this is, uh, one thing you always have to remember is, if it's unprovoked and if it's male, that's right there telling you that probably, that patient is probably going to be on anticoagulation for a long period of time, and it's probably a lifelong. So uh, that is basically determined by something called a DAS score, where you basically where I'm going to come into. And um, women, you could probably stop at six months unless they have a two of these risk factors, which is basically given with hardu two score and. Uh, how do you do prediction rule is basically hyperpigmentation, edema, redness, D-dimer, over 65, and if their BMI is high, that, uh, that those are the factors you consider. So, as, as you discussed again, so after six months, you can reduce the dose, half dose duax in these patients. So this is a DAS score, and the reason I put this here is, um, if you look at a 40-year-old male who comes with unprovoked PE, your uh, your chance of putting this patient on long-term anticoagulation is much, much higher because you have to have only one score, meaning gas score, only one point to not put them on anticoagulation for lifelong or long term. So your, your tendency when you see male patients that are unprovoked, especially if they are less than 50 years, uh, they should be on anticoagulation for a long period of time and that probably means lifelong. Okay, so that's that's the take-home message I want to put put here, um, because they are at high risk of having another blood clot. So you can see here, if you have two points, if you have two points, they basically have 6.3 annual risk of VTE recurrence, which basically means that the risk of bleeding, major bleeding, minor bleeding, we don't care about GOAX because they can be stopped, but minor bleeding, um, sorry, minor bleeding we don't care, but major bleeding, the bleeding rate is around less than 1%. So you can basically say, what is the risk of bleeding? What is the risk of VT recurrence? Is it worth or not? And from there you can go, and in this patient it is worth. So, so, that, was a, so that was a third question. How long do we use DOAC? So in male, you're probably looking at male unprovoked, you're probably looking at long-term. Uh, females, um, maybe looking at the score. Um, and if it's provoked, DVT usually three months, P usually six months. That's the that's approach you should be taking. Now let's talk about the GOAX, when do we not use them? And there are three solid indications not to use them and we should not be using these drugs in these people, okay? So one, number one is mechanical mitral valve. Heart valve, and this basically means mitral valve and aortic valve. Uh, because there was a study that was published in NHGM and basically Dazigatran, this patient had a disastrous outcome with 5% embodied rate. And this was actually combined with, uh, compared with coumadin and we still favor that these patients not be on GOAX at any time, and as much as possible, this should, these patients should be on COVID. So that's the take-home message, number one. Number two, pregnancy. Um, so we don't use these drugs. So what I tend to do with these patients is, if they are on GOAX before they get pregnant, I stop them, and uh, I put them on Rovinox. And once they stop breastfeeding, um, uh, then I switch them to uh, GOAX. So there is not much data for breastfeeding as well, so I don't, can be used for breastfeeding patients too. Uh, I still put them on uh, Lovinox. Um, and the third one is uh, triple positive endophospholipid syndrome, which basically means that there are three antibodies that are positive, locus anticoagulants, anticardiolipin labels that are more than 40, plus beta glycoprotein that, that are more than uh, 40. Those people you know, should not be given endophospholipid syndrome. These are the absolute no to do acts. And, um, and if you see any of these, uh, these patients and they are on do acts, um, they should basically be off of the axe and they should be changed to something. So, so, and these are all related contraindication and, uh, you know, it is somewhat still controversial and we don't know if we can uh, still um, use them and uh, uh, we have a different approach for these patients. Um, uh, the axe um, in renal, is renally cleared, uh, FX of 25%, the ROX band 50%. Uh, you know, we know we use it all the time in CKD patients, which is probably okay if you use Apexaban, but Rivaroxaban and Dabigatran, I would say no. Uh, you know, um, so uh, CKD is somewhat controversial. I think we'll have some more data on this one. And for now, if you were to use, use uh, Apexaban. 
and uh, extremes of weight, uh, meaning if their BMI is more than, so it used to be controversial for 40 to 60, but I think we have a little bit more data these days for BMI of 40 to 60, and you, I use them in patients whose BMI is 40 to 60, but not more than 60. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in cancer patients, uh, you can use it in cancer patients unless they have upper GI malignancy or GU tract cancer, which is also not a contraindication, but they, they actually saw that there was slightly increased risk of uh, bleeding. Uh, so uh, otherwise you can always use it in uh, cancer patients. So there have been good clinical studies, randomized controlled trial to say that we can use it in cancer patients. Uh, liver disease patient, uh, you know, again, um, liver oxygen is more um, metabolized to liver than apixaban. So if you were to favor, uh, you should favor apixaban in liver disease patients as well, especially child fit class A or B. It is very challenging to add appropriate patients with liver disease, but if you were to do it, I'll probably do apixaban. Um, and uh, what we know is triple poisoning patients, uh, antiphospholipid with antiphospholipid syndrome is a no to um, no to go ax, but what we maybe we don't know is if they are single or double positive antibody lipid syndrome, can we use them if they have only antibody positive? Still up in the air, uh, you know, I think there will be more studies coming, but I, I tend to avoid um, altogether in patients with antibody lipid syndrome and go ax, and I will put them on, uh, on cumulin. For pediatric setting, the best data we have is for. Uh, for Dabigatran, and hopefully we'll have more data. Um, and again, theoretical consideration, and we always get this question, can you use it in people who have atypical thrombosis, like splantic vein thrombosis, retinal vein thrombosis, cerebral vein thrombosis, nobody knows, it's probably okay. You know, splantic bed, uh, I think it's okay to use rivaroxaban in these patients. You know, heparin in this thrombocytopenia, there has been a very limited study, and they had 100 patients. Uh, you know, I tend to use them, especially in patients with HIT, but not HITT. Um, HITT, I'm a little bit more cautious, but uh, I, I think it's okay to use it here. And left ventricular thrombus, uh, we have no data, and for now, we stick with cumulin for left ventricular thrombus. And those are therapeutic considerations. Now, let's talk about uh, what are the GOAX and ESRD. So, you, as you can see here, in patients with uh, with um, ESRD, you know, uh, what are the drugs with more renal el elimination? Dabigatran, Pondapine, Oxaparine, all these are more renally uh, clear. But as you can see, Epixaban is less renally clear. And if you were to choose, that, that would be the drug to choose. So um, again, so um, uh, better data, hopefully, in CKD patient. Uh, and this is, uh, this is for patients with uh, ESRD. Uh, where they use this these drugs and the area of the call was uh, thirty percent and hopefully we'll have more randomized trial to answer this question. Uh, what about any first lipid syndrome? As you discussed, you know, uh, triple positive, don't put them on DOAX, put them on um, put them on um, comedy. Uh, if it's single or double positive, we still don't know what to do with those people. Uh, but uh, I tend to, there was one study published even for single and double positive and a possible fix in patients. So I tend to, tend to use, uh, use it, uh, not use it in patients, those patients as well. So my practice up to now is if they are taking uh, GOACs for APS I, uh, and a possible fix in I tend to change them to uh, Coumadin uh, uh, for all patients. Or if they are newly diagnosed, I tend to put them on Coumadin. So how about extremes of body weight? This is the other question we get all the time. You know, what do I do if they are more less than 60 kilogram? What do I do if they are more than, you know, 120 or BMI more than 40? As I said, there, these, these are the, we have a retrospective data so far to say that you can use in BMI 40 to 60. Um, and I've been using these drops in these uh, weight trains, uh, but more than 60 BMI, we should probably avoid it, uh, awaiting for the results. And this was one of the retrospective data that was done, and there was no difference between um, between Epixaban and Roxman or Warfarin, saying that we could probably use it in these patients too, with extremes of body weight. So, and this was one of the meta-analyses that we got, did where there was not much difference between the bleeding rate and then the recurrent VTE rate in these patients. And uh, it is okay to use in patients with BMI of 40 to 60. 
So, uh, what is the other DOAC drones? Probably some of the um, interactions, strong CYP inhibitors, and those include azoles and antibiotics like clarithromycin. But besides that, I do, uh, it's, it's pretty safe, you know, there, there are very less interactions. St. John's Ward, phenytoin, those are one, some of those. So, the way I remember these drugs are azoles and some of the um, clarithromycin and some of the anti seizure medications. You should be a little bit careful, but other than that, it's okay to use these drugs. Um, so uh, now let's go to uh, DOAX in cancer patients. As I, as I said, um, you know, you can use DOAX in all cancer patients, except um, uh, if you are concerned that they might have increased risk of bleeding, which is mainly upper GI cancers and GU cancers because they tend to bleed more. So, um, uh, and, uh, and some patients who, you know, who obviously if they have, uh, you know, anastomosis, or if they have resected bowel or superficial or gastric cancer in particular, or if they have, you know, uh, high thrombotic phenotype like pancreatic cancer where they are having multiple blood clots, where maybe Lovinox might be better in those patients. So those patients are the ones that maybe you should avoid it. Uh, but, um, but for all other patients, uh, cancer patients, you can use GOAX. How about HIT? Um, so heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Um, so as I said, there are around 100 patients reported in date to lit literature, and uh, we many people use it these days. But the caution I would uh, give to people who use DOAX for epidemiologic thrombocytopenia is, you have if you are using it, you have to use a full dose, full dose, as you would be doing for DVTPE, for some new DVTPE, regardless of whether it, this is epidemiologic thrombocytopenia or epidemiologic thrombocytopenia with thrombosis, meaning. What is the minimum recommended days? Uh, for apixaban is seven, and the roxman is 21. And their blood count should be more than 150 uh, before you decrease the dose, which is, um, which is you basically go from apixaban 10 milligram DID to apixaban five milligram DID in that case. Right, let's do a question, one question on that one. So I have a patient with heparin induced thrombocytopenia, high 40 score and positive platelet factor four started patient on epixaban 10 milligram DID, and today is day three, and his platelet count has normalized to 180. So you notice that his platelet count has normalized to 180, and he's ready, maybe he's ready to go home. What do you do next? So you want to change the epixaban to five milligram DID, or continue epixaban 10 milligram DID for total of seven days, and then switch to five milligram DID, or switch to noxaparin and discharge of minoxaparin, no, switch to rivaroxaparin 20 milligram DID. So again, the importance of this question is you want to make sure that anticoagulated full, fully for the first seven days you would, as you would do for the DVTPE. So although his pleasure count is more than 150, you have to make sure that the patient is anticoagulated for total of seven days. So the way to do this is you have to anticoagulate, the, uh, you tend to anticoagulate them longer. On seven day, if his blood count was still less than 150, you'd still continue 10 milligram DID. So meaning that you tend to favor anticoagulating them unless their blood count is more than 150, and you have and make sure that you have anticoagulated for 12 or seven days. If it was rivaroxaban, if it was that scenario, you do it for 21 days. That is a full, uh, full rivaroxaban dose. So now the the next thing. Uh, the most important question I get all the time is, and uh, I get especially these questions from the IR, and I get this from you know surgery is, what to do with DOAX before procedure? Um, uh, it's good that we have DOAX now, uh, but still uh, these questions come, and there is uh, besides this a study which is called a pod study by uh, Dikitas. There's no other studies that has been published, and we tend to sort of follow these guidelines. And um, I would probably do the same, uh, you know. And for most of them, you would be okay holding for uh, for a for one day, except if it's a high risk procedure, or if the creatinine clearance is less than fifty. Those are the two places where you have to hold for a few days. So that's it. And um, and when you start it, you think you start it around day two, uh, you know and you basically follow this algorithm. Yeah. But but uh, I guess this has become more easy compared to Kumlin where we had to hold for so many time and there were some of the patients who needed bridging, all those things. But 
but we don't need these things yet. So that's good. So in summary, so just to make sure that we have uh, time for questions. So in summary, so what are the uh, do's and do ads? So uh, this is first choice in AFIF and BT in most cases, unless there are exceptions. Using and uh, uh, using most cases of cancellated VTE, you know, uh, and when you um, have to um, during the perioperative period, when you have to hold these, um, you have to hold it uh, one to two days prior. As I say, if it's a low risk procedure or a low risk procedure, uh, and the clearing function is fine, it's one day. If it's a high risk procedure and clearing period is less than two or clearing clearance is less than sorry, 50, then it's two days. And then you usually resume after uh, around day two. So those are the do's. What are don'ts? Absolute don'ts are mechanical hack valves. You remember David Gatman had a, had a disastrous outcome. We don't do those. Pregnancy and breastfeeding, no, no for now. Double or triple positive, uh, triple positive mainly, absolutely no. And the possibility is no. And BMI 40 to 60, we tend to use it, but BMI more than 60, we should not use it. And what uh, maybe user not use it, at least you can ask us whether to use it or not uh, in this patient. Uh, and it's a general disease, heparin induced thrombocytopenia, and BMI maybe 40 to 60. Uh, for what we know is splanchic bed, uh, this atypical site thrombosis, including splanchic bed thrombosis, we can use the Roxman and cerebral vein thrombosis. Um, uh, we will not use it up front, but I think it's around to four weeks later, can it? So I actually had a presentation for bleeding with Duax as well, but I don't think we have time. So I will give some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Does anybody have questions? Just remember to unmute yourself. Yeah, so I have a question. Um, I'm one of the ear, nose and throat surgeons, Kim Kinder, and we, often deal with these issues, like you were talking about the patients that we have to do surgery and they're on these medications. Um, and it's something that just as a surgeon, you know, I don't feel like it's very appropriate for me to manage this. And we get a lot of pushback from the um, pre-op services. Do you have any sort of relationship with them that they can directly ask you guys these questions or they have these guidelines that they can just follow it? Because we're really trying to get help from, you know, pre-op to like a medical perspective as opposed to just the surgical perspective. So I'm new to here, I don't know. Um, so, but uh, I would assume that, uh, you know, if you send these patients to us, we'd be happy to give our recommendations. But most of these uh, things are done by uh, pre-op services. I have their own guidelines, you know, uh, but uh, it, it should not be that hard to manage those. So uh, I don't know if there's anybody that can answer that question, including Dr. Robertson. Okay, yeah, I mean, the problem is then they just turn it back to the surgeon and it's like, oh, we need to know what to do with this patient's, you know, whatever medication. And it's like, well, the whole reason we sent them to you is so you can manage that part because we're the surgeon. So it would be really nice if there were some sort of relationship there that they they are able to do that, you know, getting all this data from you guys or something like that if, if they're not comfortable with it. Yeah, that's that's a Oh, sorry. I, there um, don't seem to be any more questions or none in the chat. Uh, so let's move on to the structural heart program presentation. And that means stopping sharing your screen. Dr. Ariel, thank you so much for your presentation. And there may be a few questions at the very, very end then. All right, then the next presentation should start. Thank you, doctor, for that presentation. Um, my name's Jack, I'm part of Enlo's Medical Center's community outreach team. Um, our goal is to connect with the community, something that's ever changing due to COVID, um, and make sure that our surrounding area is aware of the different opportunities and resources available here at Enlo and our community. Um, this involves working with the referrals and being a point of contact for any questions and concerns. 
Um, our pr program's brand new, but we've had an opportunity to connect with most primary care offices in the surrounding counties. So if you've seen our paperwork in your office, um, from Enla, most likely my coworker, Bailey or I have stopped by. Um, I do wanna introduce Emma Den. She is Enlo's structural heart coordinator and then she'll have something to present to you guys. All right, well, thank you. Let me get my screen here. I'll try not to take up too much time. I know we're running a little bit late here. Um, okay, can you guys see that okay? Okay. All right. Um, okay. So just a little bit about us. We are part of Enlo's hot program. Uh, but like it said, we are, we are focusing on the structural hot procedures that we do. And primarily we have been um, focused on TAVR for now, which is transcatheter aortic valve replacement which of course is a less invasive um, alternative to open heart surgery for the treatment of severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. And so we started in January of 2020 doing procedures and we have plans to expand into other services, hopefully by the end of the year, um, but we'll see what happens. So this is our team. We're not, we're not a very big team right now, but our primary team here is Dr. Nandish, who is the interventional cardiologist then we have Dr. Pooj, who's a, who has our cardiothoracic surgeon. And um, then there's me, who I'm the structural heart coordinator. So I educate patients. I organize all of their uh, pre and post appointments and, and uh, I'm involved with the structural heart clinic as well. So Dr. Nandish, um, he has been with Enlo since 2019, but was previously at, um, oh, let me see here, sorry, the Prairie Heart Institute in Illinois which he actually did quite a few trials uh, with that program. And so these, these are just the trials that Dr. Nanish was involved in over there. Um, that's where he did his fellowship as well. But he's had over 25 years of experience. And of course we work with Dr. Pooj, who's been with them for, for quite a while, I think since early uh, 2006. Um, and then I've been with Envo since about 2014. So this is just the trials that Dr. Nanish was associated with before he came to Envo. So just a little bit about aortic stenosis. You know, there's typically four main causes that we see. Most of our patients come in with stenosis from calcium buildup or, or degenerative disease, but we do actually see quite a few bicuspid valves here as well. Um, not that many rheumatic fever patients anymore, but we do, we do see a little bit of that as well. And so um, we, so, oh, I'm sorry, I'll go back to that one. So when patients are mild and moderate stenosis, we don't typically see any major symptoms that would, would cause us to treat that. But of course, when they get too severe, that's, that's when, we, when we bring them in and, and take care of that issue. So typically if a patient is a mild or a moderate aortic stenosis, we kind of keep an eye on them with an echocardiogram every one to five years, depending on how they're feeling and what they're, what's going on with them. So once they are severe and they are symptomatic, we typically see we start to see symptoms like shortness of breath, fatigue, patients have reduced exercise tolerance, uh, certainly heart failure and the associated symptoms with that, like um, lower extremity edema, uh, angina, passing out, those kinds of things. We, we do see typically if patients are, are having those kinds of uh, symptoms, particularly chest pain and passing out, that, that's pretty critical by that point. And we, we hope that when we treat those patients that they actually get better and not worse. Um, but typically, if we catch patients when they have shortness of breath and fatigue and, and reduced exercise tolerance, they really do um, recover quite nicely. But um, most of our patients do. We do see some dysfunction with their heart already when we get to them. Uh, if they are having symptoms, we see a lot of left ventricular hypertrophy and, and diastolic dysfunction as well. Um, but as you can see here with aortic stenosis, if they're symptomatic, their survival rate is, is very low at about 50% uh, of patients at two years are no longer here. So the, the, it's really important to get those patients in to see us or see Dr. Nandish uh, when they start to have symptoms before they get really, really sick. Um, they just do far better um, as, as when treated earlier. And there's no effective medical management of severe AS. Um, 
unless it's palliative in nature and the patient does not want to have, you know, anything done. But, but yeah, so the only, the only fix for a severe symptomatic aortic stenosis is replacing that valve. So yeah, if the, and we know the longer we wait for patients, there is about a 3.7% mortality risk uh, every month that a patient delays getting that treatment done. So the sooner the better. So this is just the guidelines uh, from the American Heart Association of what defines severe AS. Um, these are all, we, we see all of this with uh, echocardiogram, of course. And so typically if a patient does have a valve area less than one centimeter squared, and we see a mean gradient greater than 40 or a jet velocity greater than four meters per second, then we do um, categorize those as severe AS. The, there is several different kinds of patients that fit into that category. You know, some patients really do seem to be asymptomatic, um, but there is definitely patients who have, you know, severe high gradients and are, are symptomatic as well. Um, but it is worth noting that we do have several patients that fall into this low grade, um, I'm sorry, low gradient um, or low flow uh, severe AS, which do need additional testing uh, to diagnose that, and we've found that um, sometimes patients will get missed or get classified as a moderate stenosis when in fact they do have severe stenosis but maybe don't have the uh, ejection fracture to, to get those gradients to, to meet criteria, um, or they have like a, maybe a low stroke volume as well. So we do see quite a bit of that, that's worth noting. And unfortunately, those patients do typically get delayed to treatment because we're, you know, they just get missed. So, you know, we, we obviously started to offer TAVR here uh, at Enlo last year, um, but as far as aortic valve replacement options go, you know, there was always conventional open heart surgery, um, or there is minimal incision open heart surgery as well, um, but, but as well as TAVR for patients who are, are now low risk patients as well. Um, we did get, let's see. So some patients are, are really just not appropriate for open heart procedures you know, because of comorbidities or, or what have you. And so that, that can be as many as 30 to 40% of those patients. And that's why TAVR has been around since about 2011. That's when we've been taking care of those, those really high risk patients. Um, but, but since then it, it's been approved for low risk patients as well. So we, the FDA approved TAVR in November, 2011, and those are for the inoperable patients. But in October of 2012, the, the high surgical risk patients got approved 2016, we could start doing the immediate risk patients for TAVR. And finally, in 2019 is when they approved low risk patients for TAVR as well. And it just kind of depends on whether or not the patient is more appropriate for TAVR or for STAVR. Um, but I just liked this. This image was actually the, this was the first human case of TAVR. It was performed all the way back in 2002 by a French physician uh, who actually also performed the first uh, valvioplasty in 1985. But this patient was a really good example of, of just not being appropriate for an open heart procedure, horrible, you know, left ventricular dysfunction and a lot of other things going on with this patient. Um, but after they tavered him, he actually did really remarkably well, uh, but unfortunately passed like four months later from, from other issues. But this was the beginning of, of taver for, for everybody, which was great. Um, so yeah. And so balloon valvioplasty we do offer it at Enlo as well, um, but it really is kind of a, a stock gap. We don't, um, it's not a, a long, long, it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem of aortic stenosis. And, and most patients typically will re-stenose anywhere from two to 12 months, just kind of depending on the patient. So if, if there isn't an option and a patient is really not doing well, we can balloon valvioplast them and hope that they recover some function and, and we'll, be you know tavered at a later time if they if they kind of regain some of their function but we do we do do quite a bit of bab as well um okay so we do have there are there's there's four valves out there being used frequently the sapien 3 the sapien 3 ultra that's what we use here at enlo and that's what dr nandish prefers to do his his procedures with and this is just kind of their um, a timeline of the improvement in the valves themselves. And so when they started out in 2002, evidently that was a 24 size French um, catheter that they used for access, which is, is quite large. Uh, but now as they've improved the design and, and, and everything that's gotten a lot better, 
the French, the size of the catheter we use now is either a 14 French or a 16 French. And that's obviously much easier to use for patients. Uh, and we have several different sizes that we can use anywhere from a 20 millimeter valve up to a 29 millimeter valve. Um, and this, this picture on this side here is just showing the S3 Ultra. It just looks a little different from the, the, the S3. And so this is the delivery system for the valve that we use. Um, it is a fairly, fairly small access size. Like I said, the 26 is pretty common. That 14 French only needs 5.5 millimeter um, access in the vessel. So that, that's pretty appropriate for most patients. We don't run into too many issues with that. So that's kind of nice. All right, so um, once we diagnose a patient with severe AS, uh, which is always confirmed by echocardiogram, that is the gold standard using the guidelines that we talked about earlier, um, we, we have to do several other tests. And you know, just, just so people know what this kind of looks like, that's, this is the velocity of the, the jet going through the aortic valve. And so if that's over four meters per second, then you know, they have aortic stenosis or severe aortic stenosis uh, and the valve area is, is listed down here as well. And you can see if that's under one, then, then they obviously meet criteria. Um, that patient in particular was having chest pain as well. And he was, he was uh, quite worrisome with the symptoms. So we treated him fairly quickly, but it is important when our patients do go through pre-testing for TAVR, we always do a heart catheterization. It is necessary to do that prior to, to any of our, our procedures. And if they do have several blockages uh, and you know, multi-vessel disease, then they may actually be appropriate for, more appropriate for open heart procedure rather than going through TAVR if, if they're gonna need cabbage anyway, there's no point in this doing a TAVR and, and just, to, just to do a TAVR, that's kind of silly. So if patients need open heart, then they'll be, they'll be slotted that direction. But if it's just a simple blockage or if the patient is extremely high risk for surgery, then we will, we will actually do, um, you know, we have done some high risk PCI in the past to get patients eligible to TAVR just to, to get them through. So that's, that's uh, not out of the question either. Um, okay, and so after the, or it really doesn't matter what stage we do our testing in, they, they are gonna need that heart catheterization, but they're also gonna need our pre-TAVR CT scans. Um, so the scan, you know, we do scan from the lower jaw of the patient all the way through mid thigh, and it does give us, well, a, a lot of information, but it does the size of the valve. It also does uh, the, the plan for the safest access to take that big catheter up on the deployment angle, which you'll see right here. And uh, the coronary heights is particularly important. So the anatomy to make sure that the anatomy of the patient is actually appropriate to TAVR. Uh, if we do see a, a low coronary height and the valve itself is about 15 millimeters high, um, we will sometimes, you know, either we will make sure we, we BAV the patient first to see that they will tolerate the, the TAVR valve, uh, but or they, they may just be more appropriate for surgery at that stage. If they have really low coronaries, that's just not, not worth risking the patient's safety for that. Um, so, so yeah, so it's really important to have that pre tavr CT scan. And this, this, these images are actually from our um, three Mencio program. It's this, the, the raw data from the CT gets uploaded and it gets uh, rendered into 3D so we can see a little bit more detail of what we're dealing with for the patient. And this is just more, more of those same images that we see on our 3D reports. And so you can see on, whoops, on this image here, this just shows the calcium buildup on the valve itself. And why this is important is uh, just depending on, on the patient, particularly if they're a bicuspid valve patient, if they have a lot of calcium built up on the, the valve closest to their left coronary system or their right coronary system, um, we just have to be really careful that that isn't going to, you know, lollipop into the, the coronary system and cause a, a major issue during the procedure. And so if we're worried about those patients or if they have low coronary heights, we typically do VAB before we do TAVR in the same procedure just to make sure it's safe. But you can see that, you know, it does show us the safest way to take up the valve. Um, and as long as, you know, as you can see on, on this side here, this patient in particular had only about five millimeter access on that right side. And so we did end up going on the left side for this patient just because it was, it was a little tight on that other side. So we get a lot of information from our scans. Um, so once we do all of the, the main workup, uh, we do have a, a consultation with Dr. Pooj, of course, um, but we do decide for the patient what the best treatment is as a group. And so 
once they have that echo, that heart catheterization, the pre tevis CT scan, and the consultation with Dr. Kuj. Um, and typically, you know, because of COVID, actually, we weren't doing PFT or pulmonary function test on everyone. But if it was uh, appropriate, then, you know, we would still do that during, during COVID as well. But um, once all that testing is kind of done, if, if the patient looks stable and they're good to go either way, we do have a valve conference where we present the patient and it's in front of the cardiology group, including the surgeon. And we kind of make that decision um, which, which way to go for the patient. Um, yeah. So as far as the procedure itself, patients, once it's decided, you know, what, what way is going to be best for them, they come into ENLO on the procedure day. And actually on the day before the procedure, we do do some PAT testing, make sure their labs look okay. And there's no, there's no hidden infections or something that's concerning. But on the day of procedure, they come into ENLO hospital and they're prepped in the, the pre and post CV unit. Uh, all of our procedures are done in the cath lab. We do get just peripheral IV access and, and post-procedural, uh, pre-procedural antibiotics to all of our patients. And typically our, our preferred access is uh, transfemoral because this is, is well tolerated by patients and it's, it's just the safest way. Um, but occasionally we do need to find another route to, to do TAVR. Um, and that's what the CT scan also is, is for. But we do access both sides of the groin. One side of the groin is going to be to take up that valve and then the other side of the, the access is for a temporary pacemaker uh, and for taking images during the procedure itself. And this is why the heart catheterization is really important because we do temporary pace the heart during the procedure. Um, we have to make sure there's no blockages so we don't accidentally give patients you know, concerns with, with uh, giving them a heart attack during the procedure. <laughs> Um, essentially, when Dr. Nedish goes to place the valve itself, we, we pace the heart to about 180 beats a minute. So it, essentially, there's standstill and there's no, there's no blood flow through the valve. And that way we have about, you know, 10 to 20 seconds to place that valve in the correct spot. And once we, we back off that balloon and, and take the balloon down, then the valve starts working immediately. So anyway, that's why the heart catheterization is particularly important. Um, all of our patients are actually monitored by uh, anesthesia. We have the cardiothoracic anesthesia group on board with us to do that, um, but it is typically deep sedation and not general, general sedation. But if we do have to go carotid access, which is the next preferred for TAVR, um, those patients do actually have the surgeon do a cut down and they are under general anesthesia for that. We don't, we don't do that under, under deep sedation, but otherwise patients, and patients do typically do really well with, with either way. Um, so we, once the procedure itself is finished and access is all okay, uh, we do always check the valve with echocardiogram after the procedure and make sure there's no, no major leaks around the valve. Um, and Dr. Nanich actually does close the groin sites with her clothes, uh, particularly on the, on the big side where the valve went up. We do use two stitches for that side and one on the other side, just to make sure there's no, no access concerns. Um, but we always make sure that looks good before they leave the cath lab. Um, let's see, and then patients typically go back to pre and post unit and then we watch them closely. We do do a lot of uh, like Q15 vital signs and groin checks and neuro checks, make sure the patient's doing okay. Um, they do have bed rest for about six hours post procedure, uh, which most patients really don't like. Um, but then we do start to ambulate the patients, hopefully the same day, if not the next morning, um, and just to get them out of bed. And of course, they're all on telemetry rather than in the hospital. And, and typically patients do stay about two days. So it's, it's not too bad. Um, we always do an ECG, make sure there's no, no rhythm issue changes and, and those kinds of things as well, or pericardial effusions. So as far as the risks associated with TAVR, the, the biggest uh, risk that we see is the need for a permanent pacemaker. And that's just, purely because of the location of the valve and the location, of course, of the electrical system running through the heart. Um, you can see, you know, this is, this is the aortic valve, of course, where we place the valve. Uh, and just because we don't take out the old valve and all of that calcium buildup is, is still present, sometimes we do find if we, uh, when we, paste, we place the heart valve, it will push all of that into Kind of the nerve conduction system here uh, running right behind it and we do see some rhythm changes associated with that. Um, typically you know that risk runs about five to six percent which which our outcomes have, have 
definitely mirrored that. Um, but it is more common to see those needs for pacemaker for patients who already have existing conduction issues like a, a right bundle branch in particular, um, or a left anterior fascicular block, or, or even a first degree heart block. We do see the need for pacemakers higher in those patients. Um, we do, you know, of course, bleeding risk is, is pretty obvious. I mean, just how we do our access, um, but we don't really see that many bleeding issues, which is, which is good. But other risks do include a one to two percent risk of stroke. Um, but we, uh, and we've, we're being pretty lucky, we're, we're about one percent for, for that as, as far as our outcomes go. But I mean, it, it does unfortunately make sense that, you know, we are dealing with a lot of calcium on a lot of these vessels. And unfortunately, sometimes it does, it does just free up some calcium and, and cause strokes. But, um, but yeah. And so uh, the other risk for, well, it is a very rare risk, but there sometimes is an emergent need for open heart procedures. Uh, this has never happened at Enlo, knock on wood, but it is, uh, there is a 0.01 to 0.02% chance to need to emergently open the patient. Um, and we are actually prepared to do that in the cath lab. We hope that that never actually happens, but uh, we, are, we are ready to do that. Um, but the, typically the most common causes of those things is a perforation of the ventricle, either by the, uh, the temporary pacemaker wire or, or something else, um, or if the valve itself um, is not sitting in a location that it should, that's obviously a huge problem. And if it goes into the ventricle, that's, that's you know, that's pretty scary. Um, so yeah, or if there's severe leaking around the TAVR valve that we, we can't fix by um, post dilation, then um, typically those patients will need to have an open heart procedure to, to then repair their valve. But fortunately it's very rare. So, um, so yeah, it's not too bad. So as far as Enlo's program has been going, so far at Enlo we've done about 140 TAVRs and that's of, of last week. Uh, we do typically go every Tuesday, uh, two to four cases, just kind of depending on, on the patient load that we've got, you know, in the wait list. Um, and like I said earlier, they do typically have about a two day stay in hospital. Um, and so we do uh, typically most of our cases are going to be femoral access, which the recovery is really, really quite fast. And actually carotid access has not been a longer recovery for patients. It is just a, a slightly higher stroke risk. So we don't like to do that. Um, but we like to make sure that we keep it as simple as possible and, um, you know, no extra lines that we need, uh, no, um, you know, no Foley catheters or, or no, no higher risk for, for infection post-procedure is, is essentially our goal. We want patients to go into the procedure and come out of the procedure and essentially just go home in a couple of days and, and feel better. So that's, that's kind of where we're at. This is our outcomes. Um, and I apologize, this is only for the first 110 cases. And uh, in 2020, we did have 102 cases. So it's just a little bit over last year's uh, total, total cases. Um, but as you can see, you know, we, we get judged, of course, on, on mortality and stroke, pacemaker rate, and moderate to severe leak. And so for Enlo, you know, we have not had any mortality in, in the first 30 days, which is great. Unfortunately, like I say, our stroke rate is about 1%. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of expected. But our pacemaker rate is, is kind of right on where we, where we expect to be, about 6%. We haven't had any major leaking around the valve, um, no major vascular complications. We haven't had any acute kidney injuries. Uh, and then sedation, you know, it's, it's best, obviously, the best practice is what the uh, TBT registry wants us to aim for is above 85% for, um, for max sedation, and we're at 96% for that. And of course, lengths of stay, you know, patients don't want to be in the hospital any longer than necessary. And so we're trying to keep that down as well. So uh, finally, you know, I know that's a lot of information on TAVR, but we do plan to add more services in at the end of 2021. Hopefully that, that happens. Um, but PFO closure, ASD closure, uh, watchman devices, and MitraClip is, is kind of where we're heading at the end of the year. And so we don't currently do these procedures, but that's, that's the plan. We're kind of ramping up to get those patients in and taken care of as well. But essentially Dr. Nandish really will see any, any structural heart patient that anyone's concerned about, we, we will absolutely see them. And if we can't deal with their issues here in house, then, then we'll send them to the appropriate place. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of us in a nutshell. And I think that's about it. Does anyone have any questions?
If you do have a question, please unmute yourself. All right, looks like uh, no question. So thank you so much for presenting that information. Um, I am recording this and we'll have a link through the Butte Glen Medical Society's YouTube channel. Um, so perhaps people will follow up after seeing that recording. All right, thank you so much everyone for joining. And um, I'm gonna sign off then and, and thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Oh. Oh, there's a nice message from Dr. Mowers. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.